You're listening to A Book With Legs, a podcast presented by Smead Capital Management. At Smead Capital Management, we advise investors who fear stock market failure. You can learn more at SmeadCap.com or by calling your financial advisor. Welcome to A Book With Legs podcast. I'm Cole Smead. I'm the president and a portfolio manager here at Smead Capital Management. At our firm, we are readers and book junkies. It can be said that leaders are readers, and we believe books provide us a great source of information for filtering what is and isn't important for us as investors. Investing is the last great liberal art and the best way to spend a lifetime of learning. This podcast is for readers, thinkers, business-minded people, and investors who want to grow their knowledge from great authors and their writing. Charlie Munger often talks about using multiple mental models in analysis. Our aim for this podcast is to help listeners test Munger's theory in business, markets, and people. Hosting this episode along with me is our chairman and chief investment officer at our firm. I could call him Il Padrino, my dad, Bill Smead. Thanks for joining. You're welcome. We're glad everyone has joined us for this episode. We're going to discuss an outstanding investor and his life uh, in in the book we we talk about today. In fact, uh, he is, I mean, one of my personal favorite. I think that would go for Bill. I'm I th- Absolutely. I th- feel like uh, part of my childhood was l- you know, listening to many of, of Sir John's maxims. So Lauren Templeton is joining us to talk about investing the Templeton way that she co-authored with her husband, Scott Phillips, in 2008. Um, Lauren is an independent director for Fairfax Financial Holdings, Fairfax India Holdings, and Canadian Solar. She is also a member, uh, pardon me, chairwoman of the John M. Templeton Foundation. Uh, she's involved with the Templeton World Charities Foundation and a trustee of the Templeton Religion Trust. Lauren is the founder and president of Templeton and Phillips Capital Management. Uh, she is also Sir John Templeton's great niece. Um, before we get started with Lauren, is there anything, Bill, that you're looking forward to in our discussion and about Lauren's and Scott's writing? Just have nothing but fond memories of John Templeton and, and just knowing Lauren is a pleasure already. Well, and to probably jump ahead, uh, I think Bill's terribly excited to do his Best Sir John Templeton uh, impression from Wall Street Week with Louis Rudekaiser. Uh, Lauren, we're, we're really glad you could uh, join us and visit with us today on your book. Oh, thank you for having me, and I'd love to hear the impression. <laughs> <laughs> you, you'll you enjoy it. Um, in fact, just to tease it ahead, it's it's, it's the impression from the 25th anniversary uh, that obviously Sir John was uh, on. So I, just to kind of start it off, I mean, I have a hunch, but I, I always love to, we love to ask authors this question. Um, what inspired you and Scott to write the book? Well, I worked with my uncle for about a decade before he passed away. And obviously, my entire childhood and life, um, I learned a lot about his investment philosophy and his style. I started investing as a child when I was seven or eight years old. Um, his career was taking off in the 80s. I spent the bulk of my childhood in the 80s. So I remem- remember watching him on Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser. My husband also had the opportunity to work with Uncle John on various projects and lived in the Bahamas for some time. And the two of us together, we thought, you know, there were some lessons that we could share with the investing public to explain how Uncle John thought about investing and how he made decisions. Also, his health was failing at the time, and I really wanted to honor him. And I wanted the book to be complete before he passed away and for him to have the opportunity to read it. So um, those are that's what inspired us to write the book. We wrote it on our honeymoon. <laughs> we, it's really funny. But um, a few years prior to that, I had been at a conference out in um, Scottsdale. And I was sitting next to a man by by a fire, and it was Jack Schwager. And Jack is the author of Market Wizards. Mm-hmm. And Jack and I had become friends, and I reached out to Jack and said, you know, I really think I want to write this book on my uncle, John Templeton. And he said, well, I'll, I will introduce you to my literary agent. So he did, and um, the agent said, it's a terrible idea. <laughs> I don't want to have anything to do with the book. So we kind of forgot about it. And Jack reached out to me again, and he said, whatever happened to your book? And I said, well, your agent hated it. He thought it was a terrible idea. He wanted us to publish you know, a small book to go by the cash register called like Templeton's you know, 10 Investment Rules or something mm-hmm. like that. And Jack said, well, let me just introduce you to my publisher. 
And so he did that, and the publisher bought the book right away. And mm-hmm. we ended up going back to Jack's agent <laughs> because we needed help negotiating the contract. But um, that's how we wrote the book, and we had six weeks to write it. We wrote it on our honeymoon. We would write in the morning and swim in the afternoons. You, you might say that Jack didn't have as much swagger as he did before. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so a, a theme that runs throughout your book shows up in the introduction written by Sir John Templeton. He wrote, quote, I'm approaching my 95th birthday and believe that there has never been a better time to be alive. We should be deeply grateful to have been born in this age of unbelievable prosperity, unquote. This was in September of 07. Within a few years, everyone was saying how bad it was to be a millennial or anybody else for that matter. What do you describe his eternal optimism as you wrote repeatedly about his glass half full approach? Mm. Well, he was an optimist, and he also believed um, and has written extensively about how important gratitude is in people's lives and really encourages an attitude of gratitude that can bring a multitude of blessings to your life. So I think that was his perspective, but also John Templeton was not myopic. He was very long-term in his thinking And often when I talked to him about investments, he would say things like, I'm trying to think of the investments I can make to benefit my foundations out for the next 200 years. So (laughs) he had a really long-term perspective. And I think if you do have a long-term perspective and you're just an optimistic person, um, that that helps because you you don't get so upset about um, you know the challenges that come with daily life. Teach Does us that make a little sense? bit. Of, oh yes, absolutely. Uh, I, I, I again, that's one of the things that makes me such a big fan. I, I try to run my own life on some of his concepts. Uh, teach us uh, about the investment lesson he learned from his father. Could you do that? Yeah. So his father was a very interesting person. Um, he was a lawyer. And of course, the the well-known story about his father was that um, he had an office in the town of Winchester, Tennessee, where Sir John grew up. That's where I grew up, too. And his office faced the courthouse stairs. And so he could look out of his office And when farms came up um, for bankruptcy, for auction, he would look out, and if he saw no bidders, he would walk down his stairs and go over to the courthouse step and buy the farm for cents on the dollar. And John Templeton always said that this was, you know, his first observation at buying at the point of maximum pessimism or buying when there were no other sellers. That's the way to get a bargain. But his dad was a really hit-it-rich um, type of guy. He was uh, involved in a variety of businesses. He was very entrepreneurial. He owned a cotton gin. Um, I think at one point he sold insurance. He owned farms around town. And so Uncle John did grow up in this entrepreneurial environment. I think his father was a risk taker. Um, he went bus trading cotton futures. Um, I think he liked to spend a great deal of money and even in his later years in life borrowed money from my grandfather. Um, And I think Uncle John witnessing this, um, he just learned a lot. First, he learned how to buy something at a discount. Mm -hmm. And I think he learned um, the dangers of leverage and borrowing. So he never recommended um, using borrowed money to investors. He did so personally. He would have never, ever advocated borrowing for consumption purposes, though. Sure. Um, But yeah, those are some of the early lessons that he learned from his father. And then later lessons, too, as his dad eventually you know, lost everything and ended up borrowing from his own sons just to support himself. His father kind of reminded me of a Munger-like lawyer where they get to the point in their career where they can make more money as an investor than they could as a lawyer, if that makes sense. Um, and I kind of had traces of Charlie floating around in my head as as you were teaching your readers about 
um, his father. So, so, um, and I want to come back to that borrowed because obviously there's touches of the book where he did that at times, like you point out for not consumption. So we'll come back to that. How formative were his early trips that his mother took them on? I'm, you note in the book that they first did kind of like an Eastern seaboard tour. And then there was another time where they got in the car and they did everything West of the Mississippi. Um, was this his mother just exciting the adventure in, in, in him? Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt, no doubt whatsoever that his mother made the biggest impact um, on his life. He, in fact, the Templeton Foundations are set up so that you have to be um, a descendant of his mother to become a member of the foundation, an honorary member. So it's all from her lineage. Um mm-hmm. He really greatly admired his mother. She was an adventuresome spirit. I mean, first of all, she was in rural Tennessee. She had spent some time as a tutor at the Million Acre um, Kennedy Ranch in in Texas, traveled by herself as a young woman. She was college educated. She funded Christian missionaries in China. So it was a very global perspective in the home. Um, I think that the gift that she gave her boys was a sense of adventure, but also the idea that you should pursue knowledge without regard for boundaries. Mm -hmm. Um, So she's just a very global orientation. And, of course, Uncle John um, not only went on these trips, but when he graduated from Oxford University in 1936, he went on a trip of his own around the world where he visited 35 nations, and he ended up at the 1936 Olympics in Berlin, which would later Mm -hmm. influence his decision to invest in, you know, 104 companies trading on U.S. stock exchanges before World War II broke out. Um, But this quest for knowledge and pursuit of knowledge without regard for geographic boundaries was definitely a gift from his mother. My grandfather um, also attended Yale University. He was Sir John's older brother. And, um, you know, he hopped on a motorcycle. This is, you know, in the days of the Great Depression and rode from Tennessee all the way out to California and then sold the motorcycle and hopped trains all the way back to Tennessee. Wow. So these were really big adventures. They did not, you know, traveling was not the way it is now. People really have to imagine what that was like without paved interstates and what the maps would have looked like. I mean, we're talking really big adventures to go on these trips. Sure. So you mentioned um, not only your grandfather, but, uh, you know, obviously John – uh, went to Yale. Um, you point out in the book that you know his classmates were only obviously interested in U.S. stocks because it's it's you know it's all they knew. It's all they you know would really pay attention to. Um, and I found this interesting because you, you know history never repeats itself, but it rhymes. And so as I'm reading this book, I was asking myself the question: Well, couldn't we actually say that today? I mean, we you know we sit in what has been really the dominant success of U.S. stocks looking back the last ten years. And if you look at where companies go public to get deep pools of liquidity and IPOs and SPACs, and well, really it's U.S. markets that dominate that. So do you see any parallels to where a college graduate gets out of school today, wants to go, say, into the investment business, what kind of companies are they likely to analyze or think about? Um, you know, not dissimilar to what it was like when Sir John, you know, was exiting Yale to go out into the world. There are some parallels. There are some differences as well. I mean, obviously... Um, when Uncle John started investing, information was a lot harder to put, sure. get your hands on. There were on. no Bloombergs. or There were or, no Bloombergs. Yeah. You couldn't bulk download data into Excel and rank companies around the world. So that's one difference. Um, but that, you know, the other thought that comes to mind is that um, – While the U.S. has clearly been a great place to be and a great market to be, we've also had the most aggressive central bank over the last 10 years. And higher prices simply lead to higher prices. And at some point, that trend will reverse. So Uncle John always advocated having the widest universe of securities to select from, really the deepest pool. And this was very important to him in his career. I think he is often misunderstood. You know, people would see him come out on Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser and 
make a broad statement like, um, you know, I'm investing in South Korea or Japan in the 1960s. But he was very valuation driven. So he let the numbers show him where to invest. And if you have a really deep universe of securities to select from, you can move capital around and avoid bubbles and markets. Um, so I think this was incredibly important in his career that he was able to do that. I mean, the Templeton Growth Fund um, benefited tremendously from his investments in Japan in the 1960s. And then as he transitioned um, money into the U.S. by the early 1980s, the, the fund uh, reaped those benefits as well. So it's important to be able to move capital and have a wide universe of securities to select from, in my opinion. What, really quick, and I don't think I put this in the notes, but originally the Templeton Growth Fund was not based in the United States. Is that correct? It was Canadian. Correct. It was a Canadian um, closed-end fund? It, it was open-end. Oh, it was open-end. Okay. Mm-hmm. But it was based in Canada, and Sir John um, started his career on Wall Street in 1937. He had an investment council um, in New York, and he built his investment council business and ultimately sold it. And the acquiring firm did not want to acquire the Templeton Growth Fund. It didn't have a lot of assets in it. I can't remember the number, like two or seven million sticks out to me. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a collection of, you know, friends and family. And it was based in Canada. So they didn't want to acquire it. And Uncle John sold his investment business, agreed to keep the Templeton Growth Fund, moved down to Nassau, Bahamas with his wife to retire, managed this little fund over a dilapidated office over a grocery store in Nassau. And, um, you know, as you know, it, 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 he developed one of the greatest track records on Wall Street. So he managed the growth fund from, I believe, 1954 to 1987. If you had invested uh, $10,000 at the inception of the fund, you would have had over $2 million by the time he sold the business in 1992. And if you compare that to the S&P 500, you would have only um, – it had a hundred thousand, about a hundred thousand dollars. So, really outperformed um, the market over that time period. Well, and to your point, and you've said this in the book, but I mean, in 1954, there was no such thing as a world stock indice, right? The the Miski world didn't show up till 1969. So, um, I mean, there was no one else doing that whatsoever, and there wasn't even a benchmark to necessarily mm -hmm. track it, which I don't think people really can have a feel for that. So he wasn't afraid then. to be lonely is what Cole's hinting at. Uh, uh, we, we used to say only the lonely can play. Uh, let, me, uh, let me jump in on, on three stages here. John re was referred to as a child who was born old. And uh, by the way, a few people have told me that over the years. We can infer what you mean by this, but explain that to our listeners. What does it mean to be somebody that's kind of ahead of their time and maturity? Well, I think he was always forward thinking, um, very long term in his perspective. He was wise. And ultimately, I think the most disciplined person that I have ever met to the um, degree that he paid a lot of attention to his own thoughts, controlling his thoughts. Um, he once told me, when I encounter a negative or an unproductive thought, I just banish it into the nothingness that it is. And I thought, well, that's so weird and peculiar that you would say that. But he was just so disciplined in everything he did. And I, I really think he, he became more that way the older he was, especially after the death of his first wife. Um, but even as a young person, he was forward thinking, um, very disciplined, and you know he he wanted to follow his brother's footsteps to Yale. He even taught a math class <laughs> because they didn't offer it at his school, and he needed the math class to gain admission. So I think he he begged the superintendent of school to let him teach the class 
so that he could then have the requirement to get into Yale University. So just a, you know, I think a really interesting kid. I mean, they had a wonderful childhood, though. Their mother really just let them do whatever they want. There was so much independence in the home. At one point, he and my grandfather had constructed an an electricity laboratory in the attic of his mom's house. And I think at one point they were conducting like 10,000 volts of electricity up there. And they were doing all sorts of funny little things that boys might do with electricity. But it was an interesting childhood. And I think she gave him a lot of room and space to grow and learn. And he was very responsible and very disciplined. You know, John was always a contrarian. And you just hinted a few minutes ago about one of the most important things he did was avoided euphoria episodes is what you were kind of hinting at. Uh, talk, talk, uh, talk to us a, a little bit about the way Charlie Munger uh, flips things upside down and, and John was always asking, where is the outlook most miserable? So th- talk to us a little bit more about what it means to uh, avoid euphoria and go digging for investments among that which is despised. Yeah, I mean, he's really well known for what he called uh, maximum pessimism. So investing at the point of maximum pessimism would be the best time to invest. And the quote is, bull markets are born on pessimism, grow on skepticism, mature on optimism, and die on euphoria. The time of maximum pessimism is the best time to buy, and the time of maximum optimism is the best time to sell. And that is common sense, but so many people, as you know, cannot do that. (laughs) So I'm sure you guys see this all the time in the industry. Everybody likes to think they can, and everybody talks about the, the concept of going in at moments of maximum pessimism and putting capital to work. But when the rubber hits the road, so few people actually can do that. It's a, it's a, psychological problem that humans have. We're not wired to be good investors, but he always looked for, you know, the place in the world that was the most miserable because he knew that's where he would find depressed stock prices. Um, So would he be looking in Russia today? No, I do not think he would. Um, He liked countries that promoted freedom, um, had very clear property rights, Um, So I don't think he would be anywhere near Russia, but those views on investing led him into really profitable trades in, say, like South Korea and the hills of the Asian financial crisis, or putting 60% of his portfolio in the U.S. in the late 70s, early 80s, around the same time that Newsweek magazine, I think it was Newsweek, um, proclaim the death of equities. Mm-hmm. So um, it's a unique perspective. I think uh, a lot of people try to have it, but not many people, when when the time is there, will actually put the capital at risk um, at the moment of maximum pessimism. Cole has a, a favorite Sir John saying about what he said about uh, buying at the bottom. Uh, uh, if if you can see the light at the end of the tunnel, Cole, it's too late. Mm-hmm. So he so he moves to Nassau in '68, like you pointed out. Um, now I assume it was way easier to do a transition like that, you know, to give up your U.S. citizenship um, and do something like that. Um, I think of it as a Roth conversion nowadays, where you pay your capital gains and you don't got to pay an estate tax anymore. Um, so I always wonder about the governmental incentive structures, which I, I know from reading a lot of Sir John, he was always skeptical of governments in some ways, hence why he had more than one foundation. Um, looking at his location, I mean, he was in Nassau. Um, I've, I've, you know, in your reading, I would draw away, it's a, it was a huge advantage because to your point, he wasn't in the rumor mill. He wasn't in the psychological epicenter where you just get tainted. Um, at the same time, there were a lot of very wealthy business people that would end up where he was living or visiting. Um, and so that, you know, prior to like reg FD, was there any advantage on that side to being in Nassau versus just being off the beaten path? I mean, we're in Phoenix, so we think about this as a, as a powerful thing, but I, I, do you look at that as being part of the, what made what, you know, John did special? I really don't. I don't, 
in regards to your comments of Reg FD and getting information <laughs> for Reg FD, and um, I don't really see that as a benefit to him. Yeah. I don't think he, if he was, I'm sure he was meeting with um, all sorts of business people, but you know, his investments were so international. Um, I just don't see that that was one of the benefits. I do think, you know, I once asked him about, um, we were riding in the car together, and I asked him about managing money in the Bahamas. And he said, you know, I've, I've given this a lot of thought. I have looked at my returns. My returns improved when I moved here. And I asked him why he thought that was. And he he said, you know, I think it's because I get the Wall Street Journal a few days later than everyone else. <laughs> so, but he was serious. He didn't laugh about it. I mean, he really thought that was the reason. Um, and I think his point is that he he didn't react to information, right? So he used information as a tool. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't, you know, reading a news story and reacting to it. Um he was just trying to learn as much as he could about the world and about the businesses that he was investing in. And he was doing that in a very disciplined, methodical way. I also think the way he organized his life in the Bahamas, that was very intentional. Mm -hmm. So his home was very close to his office. Um, you could definitely walk. I never saw him walk. He drove like a bat out of hell down the center of the <laughs> the road. Mm -hmm. I always tell people, if you see him coming, get off the road. Um, because he definitely had a lead foot. Um but his home is very close to his office. He exercised every day in the surf. Um, he spent a lot of time reading. Just a really um, thoughtful way to organize and arrange your life. It was so interesting going to visit with him. He lived in a home in Lyford Key called White Columns. I actually was just there um, about a week ago. And um, his granddaughter's in it now, and they've remodeled it, and it looks beautiful. Next to the home are cottages. So I would always stay in the cottages and spend a great deal of time in those cottages. And you would wake up in the morning, and there would be notes stuck to the windows of your cottage. So he would have thought of something that morning or that night and wrote it down on a piece of paper and went over and put it on your window so you would see it right when you woke up. Mm -hmm. So um, I always think that's so interesting that he, he would have these thoughts and have to put them down right then and, and take them to you. So um, it was we, we, great yeah, memories we, down there. We've stayed at the Island House, which is really close to, I think, his, his former office there. Um, yeah. And so we kind of have a feel for, I mean, Lauren, we moved from Seattle to Phoenix, and I think my commute went from 25 minutes on a good day to nine minutes. So we totally appreciate, um, you know, to, to your point, that the ability to focus on what's important versus what's not is a blessing. Um, mm -hmm. So so let's go more into kind of like, you know, you mentioned he doesn't like borrowing money as consumption, and yet at the same time, he doesn't mind borrowing money to take investment risk. Um, and so how do you explain, for example, like during his college years, you, you mentioned that 25% of his college education was paid for by poker winnings. How do you explain this incredibly interesting creature that God's created where there's just these fine lines that he understands really well and they're really well codified to him, but a lot of the other people on the outside were saying, well, what's the difference? Yeah, you know, he took his responsibility of an as an investment manager and advisor and counselor so seriously. Mm -hmm. So whereas he used leverage in his personal life, not for consumption purposes, but only for investment opportunities, um, and really had um, a lot of nerve in doing it, he would have never used so much leverage that he would have risk, um, put himself at risk. I think that was a lesson he learned from his dad, right? He didn't want to go bust. So he would use leverage, but not enough to take him out. But he would never recommend that to anyone else. In fact, um, there's a story, and I can't remember all the details, but during the Templeton Growth Fund's heyday, he had gotten word from some of the brokers that they were encouraging 
investors to use leverage to buy shares of the Templeton Growth Fund. Mm -hmm. And that it had created, you know, a lot of flows into the fund and been very profitable for for Uncle John. And Uncle John got up in the middle of a shareholders meeting in Toronto and said, you know, I have heard that brokers are advising this and you should not do this. And really encourage people, his investors, not to use leverage to buy shares at the Templeton Growth Fund because he thought it was very dangerous. I have met people all over the world, just the sweetest stories where, like, one really sticks out to me. My husband and I were in um, Clemson, South Carolina for a football game. Mm -hmm. We were checking into a hotel, and, you know, it was like a little, uh, I don't like a Holiday Inn or something like that. And uh, we walked up to the front desk, and the guy said, oh, your last name is Templeton. He said, you're not related to John Templeton, are you? And I said, well, I am. And he said, <laughs> Well, when you see him, tell him thank you. But because of him, I was able to send my children and my grandchildren to college. And there he was working behind the counter at the Holiday Inn. And he was saying for me to go thank John Templeton because he had, a, you know, his work had enabled the man to send his children and his grandchildren to college. What a noble pursuit. Um, so Uncle John took that that role and responsibility very seriously and things that he did himself, he would not advise other people to do. And I don't think that he was being misleading or deceptive about any of that. I think he knew very well what he could um, tolerate and the type of risk he could take. You know, when you're worth, you know, a few billion dollars and, and you use, you know, some leverage, it's, you know, he he was not risking his financial well being. Sure, the, the the poker connection I think is a is a, stacking high probability risks in your favor. It's a pretty good uh, way to cut your teeth. Yeah. Our next que- our next question would be on Sir John Templeton's best uh, axiom. The point of maximum pessimism in 1939, toward the latter stage of the Great Depression, war breaks out in Europe. The Dow falls 49 percent in 12 months. Since that is one of those famous events, can you share the story with our listeners? Yeah, I can. So it really goes back to, you know, Uncle John graduated from Yale in 19, Yale University in 1934. He became a Rhodes Scholar and he went over to Oxford and he graduated from Balliol College in Oxford in 1936. And then, you know, he, living by his mother's example, decided to go on a great trip around the world where he um, visited 35 nations. He did that on a very limited budget. Um, He was very disciplined. He would often mail money ahead of himself to keep him on budget and on track on the trip. He ended up at the 1936 uh, Olympics in Berlin where he saw the building contingency of Nazi soldiers. And I think this allowed him to correctly anticipate that the U.S. um, would be dragged into the war. As you said, um, in 1939, the stock market was down 49% in 12 months. The Nazis invaded Poland and led Europe into a full-blown war. And Uncle John correctly anticipated that the U.S. would be dragged into the war. Um, He knew that industrial firms in the U.S. would be pushed to supply the commodities and goods to support um, the U.S. entry into the world, and that even the most unexceptional and least efficient businesses would benefit. Now, Uncle John um, was always a student. I mean, he spent so much time studying. I really never saw him without reading material in his hand. But he had studied uh, the Civil War and World War II, um, and he knew that um, the U.S. would probably enact um, excess profits tax taxes, Mm -hmm. as they had um, in the other wars. And so, when he he came, you know, he 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 borrowed. um, He decided he wanted to invest. He borrowed $10,000 from his old employer, um, 
and he invested in all the stocks on U.S. stock exchanges trading below a dollar. And um, he made 104 investments. 37 of those companies were in bankruptcy at the time of his investment. So you might ask, why would he invest in 37 bankrupt companies? Um, he believed that there would be a resurgence of all businesses um, in the in the war. And again, again, the way the excess excess profits tax worked is that if you were profitable going into the war, this excess profits tax was levied on you. But if you were not operating successfully prior to the war, then you were not subject to the excess profits tax. So he knew that the bankrupt businesses would also um, also benefit. And that is his first trade in maximum pessimism that he's so well known for. He held those stocks for, I believe, four years and sold them for $40,000. So he it's, generated a nice return. If I remember correctly, the Fenner and Bean office was the one in New Orleans. And uh, Bill and I have been to that Merrill office. So yeah. uh, when, we, when we read that story, I, I, I remember people telling us while we visited there, yeah. So it, it, it's so funny about how what you just described is similar to what happened in 2020. Uh, we know that quality is a factor in investing. And of course, if Sir John or us has a choice, we'd rather buy a quality stock that's at the point of maximum pessimism than, than a low quality. But you would just explain there's a time for av avoiding quality. So he, he felt that quality was expensive, and he, and he did that a number of times over the years. How informative is this for us today? Because uh, many people think that quality is the only way to invest in a world of fangs. Yeah, I mean, he he was always reevaluating the metrics that he looked at when it came to making investments. Um, he's well known for publishing his 16 rules of investment success, and one of those rules that or it is if all things are equal by quality. But mm -hmm. in life, things aren't always equal. So there's a time to pursue that strategy and a time not to pursue that strategy. And you should always be reevaluating your measuring sticks. So a good example of that would be his investments into um, – the U.S. during the 70s and 80s, of course, the U.S. had been plagued by inflation. And um, in 1980, he moved 60% of his portfolio into the U.S. In 1979, U.S. stocks were trading at 6.8 times. And if you looked at book value... It was a really misleading um, indicator because of the rampant inflation of the 1970s. So as you mm -hmm. know, book value, if you look at price divided by total assets minus total liabilities, and you're in an inflationary stand, uh, period, that metric is going to really obscure um, – some underlying value. So he started focusing on replacement value during that time. To adjust for and cost, right? You go yes, from cost exactly. accounting to kind of a mark to market of assets. Correct, correct. So that's um, something that investors might remember today as well. So he was a big advocate of always adjusting your measuring sticks of value. I mean, he talked about that with me all the time. When I worked with him very closely, we were focused a lot on the peg ratio. That was something that he was really focused on, but that would change over time. So sure. I can't remember what your original question was. Well, uh, well, so I'll follow on that. So, you know, at one point, Peter Lynch was interested, obviously, in the peg ratio, you know, personally, and, and he talked about that. Um, so let's go, because I think the term you used in your book, which I just, I love, he, uh, the 100 yardsticks of value. Mm -hmm. In other words, there were just so many ways to measure value. And and to, to Sir John's point, those measurements had different values at different times. You yes. know what I mean? In other words, and I think that's really important. So I'm going to come back really quickly because using the 1939 example, I think the company you use in your book is Missouri Pacific as yep. your kind of poster child. And the other the other kind of quality business was at Western and Suffolk Railroad, I think was the yes. other railroad. Mm -hmm. So now – 
so I, I love this because I, I, I mean, Lauren, there's like a Ben Graham case study in your book and I don't think people really understand what you're giving them. So you, you, you know, you point out that the marginal tax rate was very high on profitable businesses. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which means if a company had operating losses from prior years, which many companies did in the great depression, carry forwards, they were worth more in a higher tax regime. And in other words, it was a growing deferred tax asset is Mm -hmm. how I think about that in accounting. And, and, we think that's really like this part of your book is just so valuable today because that's where the balance sheet actually was the yardstick of value for Sir John. W- mm-hmm. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think so. Let's jump to your other case studies that I think are great. Um, yeah, so so uh, that Japan in the 1960s is really interesting to me because as a child, I can remember people were seeing Datsuns and Toyotas come into the country, and that was considered a, a, a very a cheap good. And, uh, uh, you, you know, people thought they were low quality. And think of how that's reversed in the last 30 years. So talk to us about what he was doing there. Yeah, I mean, he actually started investing in Japan in the 1950s. Um, mm-hmm. But I think he was moving client capital there in the 1960s. So in the early 1960s... Um, Japan was um, expanding 2.5 times faster than the U.S., and mm-hmm. stocks in Japan cost about 80% less. So on average, they were trading at four times P.E. versus like 19.5 times in the U.S. But there was an accounting anomaly there. So the Japanese businesses uh, were not um, – they were not accounting for their subsidiaries. So when you looked at a company like Hitachi, which was reporting at um, 16 times, but if you consolidated their subsidiaries, the stock was actually trading at six times consolidated um, EPS. Like a pass through earnings is mm -hmm. kind of the way you think about it? Yes. So that was an accounting anomaly that he had picked up on. And it would have been hard because you have to remember, again, (laughs) there's no Bloomberg. There are a lot of (laughs) trans. Yes, exactly. I'm thinking about the translations and all of that. So he actually had to do a lot of work to figure this out. But once he figured it out, he knew that uh, stocks in Japan were more undervalued than anyone realized. Um, And so he started moving more capital into Japan in the 1960s. And obviously, the Templeton Growth Fund reaped those benefits for many, many years to come. Buffett and Munger say the key to success is weak competition. So he did something that nobody else was doing. In the right, he was pretty much yeah. by himself at that time. Yeah, because I think you point out in your book, Lauren, that I don't think capital actually even moved to Japan until there was a big move of capital. You have a great chart of in your book in 1969 where flows actually picked up, um, and mm-hmm. but that was just kind of the beginning of really some of the greatest moves that market saw. And you know, by the time the greatest moves were seen. Sir John was off peddling in U.S. stocks when no one wanted to, and the death of equities is being written. Yeah, um, but by, right. by what? By 1990, eight of the ten largest cap companies in the world were Japanese, which of course mm-hmm. they've been in a bear market ever since. And to your point earlier, Lauren, um, where are the biggest market caps today? Well, they are called U.S. stocks. So let's. Mm-hmm. Let, you have another great case study in the book um, that Sir John's uh, obviously known for, and that is what took place on the Asian contagion. Um, you know, it, it's funny, you mentioned Russia earlier, Lauren, you know, here we have the Russian ruble collapsing again. And anytime those kind of carry trade type scenarios, you know, fall apart, um, I, 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 I can just think of Sir John kind of ferreting around looking for something of interest. So can you, can you teach us about, you know, what transpired then in the late 1990s? And then I think it's really interesting what Sir John did, um, because in other cases he was buying securities directly. And in this case, he did something, um, that, probably others wouldn't have expected. Yeah, well, he he did buy uh, single securities as well. So um, as as you will remember, um, in 1997, there was the Asian financial crisis. And this was really widespread um, across Asia. But he had identified uh, South Korea as uh, the place where he wanted to invest his capital 
And he did so in two ways. One, he bought individual securities. So, of course, the story we we laugh at in our family is that he invested in Kia Motor. And he made a lot of money on the stock. Um, but he was so frugal that he wouldn't go buy himself a Kia because he was driving around Nassau in this old junker car. And um, he he thought that Kia was too expensive, but he had made a fortune on the stock. But he also decided that he would invest in a mutual fund. So um, Paul Matthews um, was the founder of um, a, a well-known shop on the West Coast of the United States called mm-hmm. Matthews. And they still manage a variety of funds focused on Asia. But... Paul, I believe, had launched Matthews in 1996. I could be wrong about that, but I think he launched um, the Korea Fund in 1996. Of course, he launched, and then there was the Asian financial crisis. And in 1997, it was the worst mutual fund on record. Um, I think (laughs) that Morningstar had ranked it. And Paul has spent some time talking with us about those days, and he said it was pretty depressing. I think that he had moved like a ping-pong table in his office. I mean, you can just kind of get the vibe that they're sure. thinking, you know, we're going to go under. Like, this was a terrible time to start this fund, and we're not going to survive this, and so we're just going to get up and play some ping-pong. And so one day they were in the office and they got a fax from um, my uncle saying that he was putting in a great deal of money into the fund. That was not unusual. That's how he communicated with people. And he would often um, send uh, new managers faxes that just said, you know, I'm going to send you $50 million today. Um, But Paul received one of those faxes. And he invested in Matthew's South Korea fund, and that was in 1997. In 1999, it was the best fund on record in the world. Um, So he had 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 a 267% um, return in two years. Now, you have to remember being the best performing mutual fund in the world in 1999 was quite a feat. Especially if you're focused on South Korean equities, because 1990 was the year of all the um, high flying tech tech funds and the yeah you know um, dot coms dot coms yes exactly so it was a feat for that to be the top performing fund but I think you know really highlights the way. Uncle John thought about markets and opportunities and the way he would move capital into points of maximum pessimism. I think it's a also a, a good um, a good example for your listeners because I think a lot of times in finance, people have a tendency to really want to overcomplicate things. Sure. Right. And they listen to podcasts or read books, and they get very intimidated by the language. Um, They're sitting there thinking, well, I don't know how to do a discounting cash flow model, and I don't know how to read financial statements, and therefore, I'm not going to invest. But there are a whole variety of of tools out there you can use. And, And sometimes you just need to find a good manager and allocate capital to that manager. And you know, there's nothing wrong with that. John Templeton himself did that. Um, and then the other thing to remember, and I use this in a lot of my presentations when I'm speaking to investors, is that I have this slide, I call it the BLT slide, my Buffett, Lynch, and Templeton. So I say I was raised on a steady diet of BLTs. But I show Buffett's track record, Peter Lynch's track record, and John Templeton's track record. And then I remind people that um, Peter Lynch's track record was so good, and yet he had he conducted a study, um, and he wanted to know what the average investor in Magellan Fund had earned. And when he was compounding in the you know mid twenties, you can kind of argue about what rate he compounded at, depending sure. on whether you're using the early days of Magellan when it was closed and all that stuff. But when he was compounding in the mid twenties, you know, he said his average investor had earned five percent or less. Some of yeah. lost money. <laughs> so how do you do that? Well, mathematically, 
you invest when the managers had a big run up and you, you know, sell when the manager has a drawdown, but you can also flip that. I tell people what's a really easy way you could have outperformed Buffett, Lynch, and Templeton. Like how could you have outperformed these numbers? Well, you simply would have added capital when they had a drawdown. So mathematically, it works that way too. Investing doesn't have to be so complicated. Um, If you find a manager you trust and you believe in their investment philosophy, so you have the fortitude to stay pat when the market falls in value and your manager goes down too, and you add capital at that time, you can really have some outstanding returns. It is um, all about a partnership between the investor and the investment manager and working well together. I I totally agree. And and I don't want to miss this point, Lauren, because I know you would agree with me. Um, We here at our firm, we love those faxes too. Um, You know, if you get a fax like that from an investor, you should just smile. Um, But I want to come back to what you were just talking about there because so Buffett, when he closed his partnerships in 69, he told the partners, hey, go go see my friend Bill Ruane at Sequoia Fund. And in reading your story, um, you know, Matthews is really Sir John saying, hey, here's my Sequoia Fund. Here's, in other words, the idea, I think a lot of people say in our biz- industry, they want to specialize. They say, oh, if you're a good stock picker, you can't be a good manager picker when they're actually not mutually exclusive. They, they yeah. are the same person, right? In other words, a good investor understands what other good investors are like. Yeah, we, we always yeah. say that. Yeah, the, the best capital allocators are probably the best stock pickers because it's the same uh, analysis that, at work. So I, I, I owe her my imitation of, oh, of, yeah, of Sir me. John. I, and, and so uh, for our listeners, uh, Sir John was the most popular guest on Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser. And, and almost every time he's on there, he'd look and he'd go, Louis, Louis, the medical discoveries of the next 10 years will blow everything that's happened in the medical world away for the last 30, Louis. We just, we, we, when, if, if, by the way, if you haven't seen it for all the listeners, go to YouTube. You can look it up. It's the 25th anniversary. Um, I mean, Lauren, you can just hear his eternal optimism just pouring out of his soul in the clip. Mm-hmm. Yeah, P- Peter Lynch it, and he were the most popular guests and they were on there. Uh, highly recommend it to everybody. So, so Lauren, since you or Scott are investors yourself, you pointed out, um, you know, you, you, you don't think Sir John would be, you know, you know, looking around Russia or figuring out how to get a trade executed with a Russian broker. Um, you point out, like we've kind of talked about, U.S. stocks are kind of in a, 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 a are kind of hamstrung, particularly you know big caps. Um, wh- what what are what are you really interested in? In other words, are there certain geographies you talked about? Replacement costs outside the United States is something that you guys have been working on. Do you have any names in particular that you just love? Because like you know, we love talking ideas, and you guys invest capital, and so we'd love to hear if there's anything that you're just really excited about. Yeah, no, we don't turn over our portfolio very much. We have very low turnover. Um, But we're constantly screening and looking at valuations around the world. Sure. How how many names do you guys own in total in your portfolios? Yeah, so on the long side, we we own between 20 and 30 names. Sure. Um, Right now, closer to 20. Um, And... We have been as low as 15 names in the past, so pretty concentrated. We have some separately managed accounts that have just 10 names in them. Sure. And then on the short side, we have um, many more positions because we want to limit the risk there. So sure. the short short positions are plentiful, and they're very small positions. Um so, yeah, it just depends. But we do like running a concentrated book on the separately managed accounts where we run 10 stocks. Um, we like those portfolios. Sure. Well, as people that run concentrated portfolios, I mean, you're preaching to the choir and all you're going to hear is amen from Yeah, us. she mentioned long duration. She mentioned concentrated portfolios yeah. and point of maximum pessimism. What could be more fun? So, Lorna, our discussion has just been a lot of fun. Um, if people wanted to read more of your writing or kind of follow uh, what you're doing, wh- where can they find you? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Probably in the carpool line is where I spend most of my time <laughs> these days. Yeah. Um, we do have a newsletter. Um, it used to be quarterly. Now we're calling it a periodical newsletter. Um, mm-hmm. 
And that can be found on templetonphillips.com. It's called the Maximum Pessimism Report. It's been a really long time since we've put out a new addition to that. I sometimes uh, speak online, um, speak at different uh, investment conferences, and those will be online. And I've started my own podcast called Zenvesting. And I have three episodes out. Um, I'm definitely not as professional as you guys. And really, the only reason I'm doing it is because it's a great excuse to talk to really smart people in the world. So um, I've got three episodes. The first one was with Jim Rogers um, over in Singapore. He's always a lively person to interview. Yep. And then uh, Amit Wadwani was the second episode. And then the third episode was an investor that focuses on social impact investing named uh, Dato Kim Tan. He's over in the UK. Uh, And I just recorded one with Guy Spear of Aquamarine last week. Um, And we'll be recording another one tomorrow. So you can check out Zenvesting and all the places you listen to podcasts or on YouTube, and hopefully we will continue producing those episodes. Your your, uh, your guests sound like William Green's recent published book, uh, Richer, Wiser, Happier, because I've seen yeah. Guy is kind of you know smattered across that book. Um, well, yes. Lauren, we we really appreciate your time. Uh, this is fun. We're we we consider ourselves huge fanboys of of Sir John and. And, um, you know, I, I tease with people I'll either die in Incline Village or the Bahamas someday. So I, I mean that with all affinity. Um, I also want to thank my dad, Bill, for hosting with me today. It's been a lot of fun. Um, Lauren and Scott's book, Investing the Templeton Way, is a wonderful study of the life, temperament, and investing style of Sir John Templeton. Um, I highly recommend if you haven't studied Sir John, it, this is just such a great way to get that in a concise way and, and get great lessons from Lauren and Scott um, just outside of his life. Um, for our listeners, if you have a great book that you'd like to recommend, email podcast at smeadcap.com. That's podcast at smeadcap.com. Thank you for joining us for a Book with Legs podcast. We look forward to the next episode. Thank you for listening to A Book with Legs, a podcast brought to you by Smead Capital Management. The material provided in this podcast is for informational use only and should not be construed as investment advice. You can learn more about Smead Capital Management and its products at smeadcap.com or by calling your financial advisor.